Hello, um, welcome to this edition of SCI Care, What Really Matters. And it's the next episode in our series of webinars in collaboration with our partners, the International Spinal Cord Society. Today, our webinar is titled Surviving to Thriving, the Importance of Lived Experience in Bladder Management. And I'd like to welcome you. I'm your host, Dr. Kim Anderson. I am a scientist um, studying spinal cord injury, but today, more importantly, I'm talking uh, with you from my experience of living with a spinal cord injury. I've lived with a mid cervical level spinal cord injury for 33 years, and I'm in the United States. I've lived in five different states in that period, and my bladder management choices have been really critical in enabling me to live the life that I've been able to live. And so today we're gonna to talk about bladder management, but not necessarily from the medical perspective. We're going to be talking about it from the lived experience in the importance of lived experience in enabling uh, a, a person to survive, move from surviving to thriving in their lives. And I've got an excellent panel of individuals from around the world that are gonna help me win our webinar today. And I would like them to introduce themselves. So first, um, Shivjeet, please introduce yourself. Hello, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Shivjeet Singh Raga, and I'm working as full-time peer counselor and patient education coordinator uh, with the Indian Spinal Injury Center in India, in New Delhi. Uh, I'm also associated uh, as vice president for the Spinal Foundation, which is a self-help group on the lines of spinal injury association in various countries. I'm also involved at Asian and uh, global level with the spinal networks in different areas. I'm a person with spinal cord injury from the last 42 years with C5 injury. And uh, over the years, I have seen the change in bladder management scenario and uh, how things have really changed the lives of uh, persons with spinal cord injuries. And I'm sure I'll be able to uh, share a lot of experience uh, with you. Uh, Thank you, Shivjeet. And Rafaela, would you please introduce yourself? Good afternoon. I'm Rafaela Tarascio, Customer Care Coordinator for Wellspect Italy. And I am honored to participate to this important event promoted by ISCOS represent here the contribution that WellSpect brings to the evolution of the peer support. Thank you. And Ari, now, can you please introduce yourself? Good afternoon. Thank you. It's a great privilege for me to have the opportunity to present and share some of the experience um, that I've had in being a person with a spinal cord injury, I have a C5 injury from 1985. Um, and also I'm the former CEO of the Quad Para Association of South Africa. And um, relevant to this talk today, my role, one of my roles there was to lead a team of uh, doctors and researchers in establishing better management protocols um, that we've recently just achieved here in South Africa. And I'd like to share that with you. Thank you. Welcome to everyone. And I look forward to our discussion. Because we have such an international panel, we're gonna start from hearing each of our panelists about bladder management in their country and where they are, how far have they come? The, what is the lived experience in their country? And what is thriving? How, what is the gold standard in their country and how are they getting there? How are they trying to get to thriving? So we're going to start with Shivjeet from the perspective from India. Thank you, Kim. Uh, I would say when we talk of India, bladder management has evolved quite a bit. And it's evolving further. At one point of time, the complete dependency on diapers, condom catheters, indwelling catheters is a gone by time now. And you see presently the focus is on education, training about intermittent catheterization, 
and it has really changed the scenario of bladder management. And you see dissemination of knowledge about uh, prevention of urinary infections, frequent availability of uh, <clears throat> catheters and other related materials, lesser urinary related complications have resulted in lesser hospitalizations, re-hospitalizations rather. And you see the money they save from that is being used for some recreation, sports, uh, for job purposes. So the scenario is really changing. And you see at presently the spinal centers and spinal units and even other multidisciplinary hospitals which are here, they are very well equipped with urodynamic facilities, the cystoscopy, uh, the ultrasound scanning and things. So it has really changed the scenario which was there a few years back. And you see the tremendous change which has come in evaluating the bladder, the urinary system, and thus the bladder management is far, far better now. Best thing is that access to the information through smartphones, even in the rural areas, in the remotest of areas, has really changed the scenario uh, for betterment. As far as I'm concerned, my injuries, as I mentioned, is 42 years now. And uh, I have seen a total change from what the rudimentary practices were there and now what latest uh, with catheterizations and as I mentioned about all these uh, <clears throat> diagnostic facilities and uh, uh, complications have really uh, minimized. So I'm really living a wonderful life. No doubt, first 20 years were quite struggling uh, because of this, and uh, but I was managing somehow. Uh, I never gave up. Uh, but from last, I would say 20 years, if not more, at least I'm very, very uh, <clears throat> proud to say that I hardly had any complications or any serious infections or things like that. But before, before that, I had uh, a lot of strictures, uh, problems like uh, even hydronephrosis was there at one point of time, uh, which created problem. <clears throat> but now, as I said, things are far, far better. And you see, now what I see is people are really uh, thriving. Persons are coming out of the shelter of their homes and seen in schools, colleges, offices, corporate buildings, theaters, playgrounds, and that are everywhere. So major hurdle of bladder incontinence gone, is gone. The anxiety of fear about uh, making friendship, relationship with opposite sex is now really declining. People are roaming around with their partners, making marriages, having children, and leading a quality life. So what I see is now they are not just surviving, they are really thriving and their life is far, far better uh, as compared to anyone else. Next I would say is the gold rule which is there is, the secret is lies in timely educating and training about bladder management, the prevention of urinary infections, related complications, and equipping, equipping them with power of knowledge and guiding them about regular blood tests, ultra scans to check functioning of kidneys and other urinary system is a must rather. And in case there is some problem somewhere, the, they shouldn't wait for the crisis to come. They must straight away uh, go to a medical expert, a ur urologist or somebody to take action. So I believe if uh, things are being taken care, uh, it can really lead to a wonderful life. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you Shivji for sharing um, the experience in India with us. Now we're going to hear from Rafaela and the experience in Italy. Thank you. 
in WellSpec, we offer innovative and proven products and solutions for bladder and bowel management, like the well-known Lofric and the Navina systems, delivering true benefits that make a real difference in people's lives. Despite their challenges, our users have busy lives and therefore want the convenience of our product and dedicated services. That's why we have developed WellSpec with you, our user service that provides customized solution, personal help and professional advice. WellSpec with you is our full service offering adapted to the regulation and the requirement of each country with a common goal to assist in the best possible way. We support users through a wide range of services such as home delivery, customer service, training and education. People affected by spinal cord injuries who began bowel irrigation and intermittent catheterization must cope with the new condition and the new therapy. At the same time, healthcare professionals aim to secure the health and well-being of the patients. They want to use medical devices that are safe and reliable in the long term and educate the patients in order to ensure therapy adherence. For this reason, they may find helpful to inform the patients about the WellSpec with you service suite. We share the same goal after all, patient health and well-being, appropriate use of resources and promotion of the economic sustainability of the healthcare system. Now I would like to share with you the, the experience of WellSpec in Italy. As a customer-centered organization, we wanted to deliver a superior customer experience. And for this, we started by asking to our customer their needs. In 2021, we conducted a study with a focus on those aspects affecting patient satisfaction, such as continuity of supply, staff competence, empathy. Patients were invited to an online independent survey. The questionnaire was based on the serve-qual method, a multidimensional research instrument validated to capture consumer expectation and perception of the service. This model helped to bridge the gap between customer expectation and needs. The survey measured individual perception and expectation from services among five dimensions. Reliability in provided services, assurance that is the ability to convey trust, tangible aspects like communication channels, empathy and responsiveness, that is our ability and willingness to help end users. WellSpec satisfaction index is highly positive. The main aspects affecting patients' autonomy and therapy adherence, such as continuity of supply, competence, prompt service, and accountability were rated as satisfying by more than 80% of users. Thanks to this survey, we have also identified the possible actions for improvements. We want to be more accessible through digital communication channels and improve our ability to aid end users. We concentrated our attention on customer-oriented solution to empower users. This was the rationale behind the decision to launch a new service component, the peer-to-peer -peer approach. In designing this new service, we have been assisted by the proven experience of WellSpec UK, also has been, who also uh, has been successfully offering a peer support for many years. We started from the foundation of the peer-to-peer -peer approach, that is a person who is fundamentally similar to the recipient. In this program, a peer is in a position to offer support by virtue of relevant experience.
glad to introduce you Fabio Raimondi, our peer-to-peer -peer expert. He is a wheelchair basketball, basketball legend and at 49 is still making a real difference. He has represented Italy at the Athens 2004 and London 2012 Paralympic Games. He has won five league titles and two European championships with the national team who he captained for 10 years. With the support and encouragement, Fabio Raimondi turned his passion in, into a career. Every day he shares his inspirational journey and the joy of competition. After a specific and continuing educational program with a professional counselor, Fabio is able to act on the following areas. Listen and give attention to patients' problems and use a coaching approach in facilitating a positive behavior change. Understanding and bringing out the needs of patients and caregivers, helping them to accept the new condition. Reassurance and supporting to make the person feel less scared, upset or doubtful. Giving advice and life stories as a source of inspiration and encouragement and empowerment, helping patients to realize their own ability and potential to help themselves. Because a person-centered approach involves listening, thinking together, coaching, sharing ideas, and seeking feedback. The Italian Spinal Cord Injury Patients Association has highlighted the importance of peer support as an activity already valued in the International Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, issued by United Nations and also adopted in our country. Most spinal cord units include a peer expert in their multidisciplinary team in order to support their patients. In WellSpect, our peer-to-peer -peer support is positioned to provide one-to-one -one assistance to end users and support to hospitalized patients. We organize individual calls and social inclusion projects to talk about sport, traveling, emotional life and family, driver's license, home automations, and many others. These are just a few of the topics that can be defined with each clinical center through a close collaboration and partnership with Fabio. Fabio's support is based on a counseling methodology and applies the principle of mutual aid. Users who share the same experience acquire awareness of their condition in its limits and potential. Fabio does not replace an healthcare professional and Fabio is not a sales representative neither. Thank you. Thank you, Raffaella. I will now share a little bit of an experience from the United States perspective. It was really in the 1930s that people with spinal cord injuries actually started surviving spinal cord injuries in the 1930s. And it was during that time that healthcare providers started talking about bladder management options. And at first, they used a concept called tidal drainage, which is trying to mimic what normally happens in the body, slowly filling up the bladder and then rapidly emptying it. And they used a, a very strange contraption to make that happen. And then over the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, we really learned a lot about bladder management and how to um, develop different options such as intermittent catheterizations, how to manage infections, and how to prevent infections to the point where by the 1970s, um, a disease pyelonephritis was largely reduced. And that's where you have the kidney inflammation due to bacterial infection in the bladder. And, and people were really dying from that up until about the 1970s. And in the 1980s and on, many other bladder management options started to become uh, available. So 
not only intermittent catheterization, but the suprapubic tube surgical option became available. There was um, various different types of bladder augmentation surgeries that were developed to try to um, overcome the shrinking of the bladder that can happen. There were some medications that were developed and starting to be used. Um, importantly, anticholinergics, which can prevent the hyperspasticity that can develop in, in many people with spinal cord injuries. And with those medications, you can prevent the leakage um, that, can, that can happen frequently. And it was in 1988 that I was injured. And I was very lucky when I was in the hospital to, I guess, randomly be assigned a urologist that came to see me. And he offered me super pubic tube. And they, in the hospital, they had been doing intermittent catheterization. Because of my injury level, I didn't have the hand function or the arm strength to do intermittent catheterization by myself. And so we decided to put in a suprapubic tube. And I'm, I, I, I cannot praise that particular bladder option enough. Being a woman with a cervical spinal cord injury, having a suprapubic tube enabled me to become independent. And I was able to go to college and, um, and meet the schedule that I needed to meet in order to achieve all of my classes and graduate. And then I was able to go to graduate school and able to go to work because I didn't need to rely on another person every certain number of hours to empty my bladder. And so now in 2020, there are many different options for people with spinal cord injuries. And, but there are some problems in the US still. And so clean intermittent catheterization is the gold standard here. But as I mentioned, um, someone with limited hand function may not be able to do that by themselves. And so if they rely on another person to catheterize them um, every few hours, then they run into issues where they may have to um, pay for an attendant if they don't have family to help. And because there are financial issues with attendant care coverage in the United States, that can be a barrier for people to choose uh, intermittent catheterization. Now there's also um, as many advances in technology, there are closed system intermittent catheterization options that are designed, um, one, to also help people with limited hand function, but also to help reduce infections. But in the United States, the insurance companies can be a major deciding factor on whether somebody can get access to closed systems. And quite ironically, it doesn't make sense. The closed systems are designed to prevent infection, but in order for an insurance company to continue paying for somebody to get access to closed intermittent catheterization systems, they have to have documentation of bladder infections. And so it, it doesn't make sense. You're in this cycle of you're trying to prevent infections by using a closed system, but then in order to keep getting the closed system, you have to show documentation of, um, of infections. So that's kind of a, a, an access barrier that people are experiencing. The other issue, um, which really result, revolves around insurance in the United States is getting access to a urologist or a neurourologist that understands spinal cord injury. There are fewer neurourologists than there are urologists. And so that can be a limitation. Um, and also many, many urologists may not have ever come across a person with spinal cord injury. So when you try to find someone that's knowledgeable, that can be a barrier as well. And in addition, um, depending on what kind of insurance you have, 
They have these networks that you have to stay within in your network, depending on where you live or whatever your insurance company is. May, it may be difficult for you to try to get access to a urologist that understands spinal cord injury. So in the United States now, um, peer education and peer networking is really the way for people to try to get um, an understanding of all the different options of bladder management out there. And what has been the real life experiences of other people, you can, through networking groups, you can ask, you know, other people, have you ever had this experience? Have you ever had that experience? How are you managing this? How are you managing that? And so really through that lived experience is how we're trying to get people to thriving. They are surviving, but we still have some challenges ahead of us. And now I'd like to um, give Ari the opportunity to speak to us from the South Africa perspective. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, indulge me first to say that, wow, just being in the audience here, um, although I'm on the presenters panel, I've learned so much from you, Shavit, Rafaela, and Kim, um, just with, with that sharing. And I think that the sharing now is so powerful. So thank you very much for um, um, uh, the learnings that I've already had this afternoon. Okay, I'm going to share the journey that um, I um, sort of facilitated on behalf of the Quad Para Association of South Africa and was part of right from the beginning in terms of uh, developing better management guidelines in South Africa. And I'm talking now about uh, the long journey to gold standard uh, for better management in South Africa. Now, this journey, it must be quite clear, was, was shared. The, the lobby and advocacy, especially the adv advocacy work, was a shared initiative between the Southern African Spinal Cord Association and uh, the Quad Para Association of South Africa. All right, so I'm going to go through some of the elements of my slide. To be honest, people with spinal cord injury uh, in South Africa were... were in a huge dilemma, you know, believing that it was quite natural to have one or two um, bladder infections a month for the rest of their lives. It thought that that was the way it was, or that's the way it's going to be. Uh, many years ago, I'm talking about in the 80s, in uh, the most recognized spinal unit in South Africa, the, the government spinal unit, they would uh, cut the sphincter um, and so make sure that your bladder just leaked the whole time and you would have a urine bag. So that was the, the standard protocol. And there was a call, of, a call for change amongst people with spinal cord injuries. They had had enough of that um, un, unusual um, uh, procedure and also had enough of bladder infections with whatever protocol was being um, directed by a urologist or in, in, the spinal, in, the, in the formal spinal rehab units because um, the medical, medical practitioners, you know, ha hadn't got together in a group and put their heads together with what would, could be the gold standard. And so we called for change. And the Quad Para Association of South Africa, which I'll refer to as Quasa, we took the lead. We took. We, we we decided on consumer advocacy. So the consumers decided this is not good enough. We want to do something about it. Now, it's quite interesting. How did we know who we are as uh, consumers? Quasar started a very interesting project called Bags of Hope, and that was we introduced a rucksack bag that you would that you could traditionally hang on the back of your wheelchair for all people that were in the spinal cord un uh, uh, units. Uh, a week or two before discharge, we would have these bags delivered. In the bag was a magazine about spinal cord injury. Uh, there was um, um, what organizations to join, disability organizations. There was a book on human rights for people with disabilities, etc. It was this bag of hope, lots of information in this rucksack bag. It made absolute sense. It, it sort of matched um, the bag that people, that, uh, that women, when they have kids, they get in the hospital with various creams and nappy brands, etc., and so in exchange for that, we would get a card that we would receive at the Quad Para Association telling us who the recipient was, the age, how they had their accident or injury, um, their names and addresses. And so we developed from 2003 a database of all people with spinal cord injury in South Africa. 
And that was extremely valuable because now we could talk to the consumers of products in the spinal injury field. We then approached the Southern African Spinal Cord um, Association uh, with this dilemma, and we've got into a relationship which we have had over the years on various issues, but also various opportunities. And we formed a strong relationship and a commitment to looking at solving the problem of constant um, bladder infections amongst us, which hospitalizes us, which creates tremendous amount of expenditure and cost to our medical aids or our reimbursers, as well as to the state, if we were state patients. And um, Quasa then, I took the lead and we managed to secure some funding in a project that was going to talk about RC and the reuse issue. We took a stand, quadriplegics and paraplegics got together and said, we will not reuse catheters. That's it. You know, the, the, the standard protocol was to have the single use, to have this reusable catheter that would, you would only get funded once every three months. And that's what leads to bladder infections if you're using RC for your bladder management. So we made a commitment to, we're not interested in, in reuse. We want single use or whatever we're using. Um, and I drove a program and started the Continents Advisory Panel in 2013, which we went around and we encouraged um, all of the leaders, the leading doctors or those doctors that were running uh, the spinal um, uh, rehab centers in South Africa. Um, we ran to a panel and um, they started literature review and research. Well, this was fantastic. What we did similarly at the same time at Quasar, we had focus groups on various subjects um, and um, asking them to try out various products as well to get feedback. And so all of this information was being gathered uh, by um, the content panel. Um, and then the guidelines were, were published. And uh, my next slide will show you um, the subject material of the gold standard guidelines. And this was a fantastic breakthrough for us, as, but, but that's all very well. But now we needed the guidelines to be adopted and funded by the, by the medical aid and the reimbursers and government agencies that pay for these um, um, intermittent catheters um, or single-use catheters. And uh, so we engaged the reimbursers in a number of workshops. Uh, we held all over the country. We brought people uh, internationally across um, high-level people that had good credentials, who spoke about um, the cost saving as well. Although we don't agree on just saving costs, we agree on having the choice of what we should be using for our banner management. And slowly, slowly, we've got the reimbursers to buy into the fact that if you use single-use catheters for your an intermittent, intermittent catheterization, uh, that uh, there would be um, uh, it would be beneficial for them. Less days in hospital, less bladder infections, less pathology, which they have to pay for, less cost of visits to the doctor. Now, here's the conundrum, which, which um, I used an example which actually made the penny drop amongst even a non-consumer of RC, is that if you buy Coca-Cola at the shop, you get your can of Coke or your bottle of Coke, and you get a straw with it. Now, I've never seen any anybody and we never see anybody now you throw the can away when you finished in the bin but no one uh, you throw the can and the straw away i've never seen anyone keep the straw and put it in their pocket until they buy another can of coke i mean it's inconceivable to think that anyone in the world does that keep the straw well how's this for, for uh, how is it possible then that we can be expected to reuse catheters um, if, um, you know, we, it's not conceivable to reuse straws. And so uh, I think that, that um, the concept of that made absolute sense to people that were listening to us. Um, over and above running workshops, uh, then we ran workshops um, with um, all sorts of health professionals to get them to understand the gold standard, which we were expecting. Um, we published a publication, which I'll show you, which showed the consumer how to claim and how to persuade your reimburser that this is the way to go. So there was an algorithm um, which we got them to understand. They say, if they don't fund, if they fund, yes, then go to that protocol. If they don't fund, no, then you write this letter. And we even gave them the contents of the letter. So it looked like they were empowered to understand the legal and the human rights issue regarding data management. Um, 
so after the publication, we did some training with, with all the all the different um, stakeholders in this um, in this field, uh, in, 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 including um, consumers, and we also then um, took litigation against one of the medical aid companies and decided, all right, if you're not going to fund single-use catheters, let's say it's 150 a month, we're going to take you to court, and we won the court case. So that court case then made the other medical aids realize, wow, we're not fooling around here. Um, we were really serious about our bladder management, and therein lay the success. So it was quite a long journey. It took a big investment. We had partners along the way, and of course it was driven by, um, uh, most importantly, the relationship between the health professionals in the spinal cord sector and the consumers, those being quadriplegics and paraplegics. So you ask me, what was the tipping point? You know, and that is making sure that you've got a strong relationship with your health professionals. Um, so the continents advisory panel came up with guidelines for quality and sustainable bladder management in the neurogenic bladder patient in South Africa. There's a list of everybody that partook. We made a declaration and there's a reference at the bottom to where you can actually download those guidelines. So it was a huge breakthrough and we managed to get this published in the South African med, um, Medical Journal, which meant that um, I think a urologist or anybody that is now prescribing better management to someone takes note and realize this is a published document. It's not just something that we came up with, you know, in a Word document and, and just, um, you know, emailed and prayed that people would take note of it. You know, it really has a strong credentials behind it. And um, then the Quad Pair Association published this book, which is um, motivating for a better quality of life, and that's navigating your way and successful dealing with medical schemes. I mean, it's all very well having gold standard, but if no one's going to fund gold standard, then you know you've lost the battle. So we think we did well. We've still got a, a bit of the journey to go, but I think we're getting to the end of the runway with um, people buying into the fact that we won't reuse any product into our bladder, and we have the right to decide on our um data management protocols which must be funded in full that's me i hope that uh, the journey that we did um you know give some guideline to how to fight the big fight to get people to stand up for uh, their rights on data management how to get them reimbursed and that the partnership is the way to go in solving this problem thank you very much ari so we've had a wonderful um discussion from uh, four different countries now, and I think we've, we've started to learn about the importance of education and how it's really critical to make informed choices about bladder management. Um, it's really important for people to know what are the options, what are the implications um, for their gender, their geographical area, their lifestyle choices, and it's really important to um, to have interactions with professionals as, as well as peers living with spinal cord injuries. And education really means freedom, it means empowerment, it's knowledge, and education is really what will enable people to thrive and not just survive with their bladder management. So um, I'd like to ask each of our panelists to give their perspective on, we know about bladder management, what's the gold standard in your country, but how do we make choices about bladder management for the individual and the life that they might want to live? So actually, I might start with Shivjit. Can you talk about that from your perspective and from IDNIA as well? Uh, thank you, Kim. You see, uh, if we talk of India, I told you uh, what all is available now. Uh, as far as uh, from the professional point of view is concerned. But now how to take the horse to the water, that is one. And secondly, as I told you, uh, over the last 40 years, I have seen the change which has come and what I faced uh, uh, right from uh, tapping methods and the credits maneuvers and things like that. But you see the Awareness has to come through the peer mentors and peer group rather. And that is what has really made the change as you all friends mentioned in your talks, 
Uh, but in India too, you see the uh, peer friends, the peer group people, they came forward and they came and they formed uh, various self-help groups. Uh, as far as uh, Spine Foundation is concerned, we have a WhatsApp group of peer mentors, which we have almost 150 members from all over the country as peer mentors. There is one group and we have a professional, a urologist and a physiatrist on the group. Uh, we see to it that uh, the scientific uh, uh, part of the management is not uh, compromised in any way rather. And, and then we one for paraplegics, one for South India, and all, because language barriers are also there. So at least at their level, in their uh, dialect, the information is available. And we have trained about 150, 140 peer mentors from all over the country. And each of them looks into uh, uh, maybe at uh, almost a diameter of 100, 200, 200 kilometers and uh, looks after the newly injured people and guide them properly rather. And also guide them to uh, reach to the uh, professionals. Uh, uh, we have a list of professionals who are working in spinal cord injury area, the urologist and the neurologist, all those people. So it is really through the peer mentor groups that thing uh, that real change has come. And uh, now I would say, uh, good thing is that in the hospital also, as I am working, also in other Asian countries, peer counselors are there full time in the spinal units, and they are part of the rehab teams. So whatever goal planning is being decided, they they are part of the goal planning. Even today, I attended one uh, for, for five patients. We held it in half for half an hour each other. So that is really making a difference uh, because the newly injured people learn from you and you from your experience. Because you see what professional teach you as a protocol, what they have learned over the years from books or through their research, whatever, but they are not individual with spinal cord injuries. They are, uh, whatever they uh, teach you is uh, through their uh, medical uh, education, which they have uh, learned over the years rather. But if a peer mentor or a peer counselor or a peer support group friend is there in a link between the newly injured and the professional, that really percolates very well rather. Because he's or she is able to guide them about the practical management, which is always may not be as per the uh, scientific protocol which urologists and neurologists uh, do advise you rather. So that really makes a, a difference in the management. So I would say peer mentors, but thing is even in the uh, uh, Indian Spanish Injury Center where I'm working full time, we have a, a patient education class every week rather. And you see that class is attended by no doubt the inpatients and outpatients and all those people, but professionals, the physiotherapists, the occupational therapists, uh, even the doctors uh, get to attend that. And the speakers is usually the peer counselor, uh, one time female, one time male. Sometimes we invite somebody from outside. So at least that message goes to the professionals also. He what exactly the uh, persons with spinal cord injury need. They, uh, and because the peer gives the talk, it has a real impact on the a person with spinal cord injuries or the patients who are there for the rehab and treatment otherwise. So that is, I believe, is the key, uh, which is uh, playing the most important role. Yeah, and I, I can tell you, I can share you from my own experience over the last 33 years with my super pubic tube. Um, I originally started out with a latex um, catheter, and I was starting to have issues with sediment getting clogged up. And I learned um, about that they made silicone catheters. And so then I switched over and I tried silicone catheters and I didn't have um, as many issues with the clogging of the catheter. And then also over time, I would um, managing the sediment was always something that I had to manage. And um, my um, urologist had recommended I irrigate the catheter with 
um, distilled water. And he taught me, I didn't have to be sterile, I just had to be clean. And so I would start um, having somebody flush my catheter um, in the morning and in the evening to try to reduce the sediment. And then also I had um, been on a medication that helped reduce sediment and over time the medication stopped working. So then I had learned about people with lived experience that had tried cranberry pills. Um, so I had tried, I started taking cranberry pills for a while and that started helping with the sediment. And then over time, this, the cranberry pills stopped working. And so then I just I experimented and I started drinking cranberry juice. Now I know you have to be careful about the amount of sugar that's in cranberry juice. So I found a diet cranberry juice that had very little sugar in there, but still was able to help me with managing the sediment. And so now, you know, I've got a very good program I've learned um, about different options that when things start to change, how do you try to navigate those options? How do you try to figure out what you need to do? Um, that's been really helpful for me. Um, Raffaella, can you share with us from Italy, um, how do people get to the real world bladder management um, that they need? Thanks, uh, yes. Uh, uh, Thanks to peer-to-peer -peer expert and Fabio's support, our users do not feel abandoned after the beginning of the therapy and appreciate the human relationship, especially after the COVID pandemic. Sometimes the positive impact of Fabio's experience is requested by healthcare professional when patients face major challenges because of their condition. Device reimbursement and supply issues are also very required information by our users. Initially, we thought it might be a problem for Fabio to contact women and talk about very intimate topics. But in fact, there, no, there were no psychological barriers, but a total openness and trust. Our users were very impressed by the fact that we show a sincere interest in them without any commercial approach. In 39 years, we in WellSpect have built a wide experience and knowledge of people who live with this condition. And we know that the main needs are primarily related to the right to health as a psychophysical and social well-being. It means having access to appropriate rehabilitation and safe therapeutic solutions that allow them to enjoy a full and independent life and minimize discomfort. We believe that assistance and personalized services allow them to acquire the necessary confidence to successfully include the therapy of intermittent catheterization and bowel irrigation in their daily life, improving the quality of their life. Our ultimate goal is help our users to forget their worries and just keep on living. Thank you, Raffaella. It's really, really is um, important to share that lived experience and, and people have a bond with other people with spinal cord injuries. So it doesn't always matter whether you're male or female or, or you know, quad or para, you can connect with other people's um, experiences. Ari, can you tell us a little bit about how you, I mean, we, we've seen how you got to a gold standard and not having to reuse um, catheters in South Africa. But now how do people make decisions um, about wh what's the best for their life and whatever, wherever they're located in South Africa? Okay, that's great. And I think that was very appropriate. Um, um, the missing link to, to my presentation. Yes, so we have an initiative which is ongoing of engaging with the urologists who script, who script what they should be scripting, but whose knowledge is now being empowered by the gold standard, whereas the urologist would traditionally script a reusable catheter, it used to be called a Fuji catheter, they now rethink the protocols. Um, it's really uh, no skin off the teeth, um, the reimbursement battle. 
Um, but so we we need we are in partnership with them and the Urology Association, get them to understand our gold standard and to subscribe to it and prescribe it. It's very, very important. Then, of course, the users themselves, who are so used to such a bad protocol, uh, those are the consumers. So we use a publication called Rolling Inspiration, which is um, a lifestyle magazine uh, for people with mobility impairments that the Quad Para Association publishes. Together with the buy-in from all of the um, medical experts that work at the rehab centers, so they've got first touch with their patients, um, and um, peer support, there's no doubt this can't be done with uh, those informal discussions that happen around a basketball court, a quad rugby court, or whatever, the peer support program, something similar to what Jacques is running in South Africa. So the combination of all of that, we feel, covers the ground um, to getting people to realize there is there are better management protocols now, and uh, we, we, we will not um, accept anything less. And then, of course, we have offered free legal support. Um, for, if anyone wants to take on their medical reimburses, uh, regarding the cost and the payment of these, we will offer free legal support for them to take the model because it won't take much more than a case or two uh, before the reimburse. And at the end of the day, you will be healthier. Uh, by using the gold standard. So I hope I've said enough in a combination of what all of you have said, I think um, is the way to get those gold standards, you know, into the hands of the users who are uh, managing their bladders every day. Thank you, Ari. So we have learned so much today about um, the various different bladder management options, but how to get access to the options depending on where you are and how peer support groups can help um, enable people to get access to those options and also enable people just to get knowledge about the different options that are out there. And really it's that knowledge um, and education about bladder management options, what's available, what's the gold standard, and how to merge the two of those into the right bladder management for you. You want to avoid complications, but you also want to have the freedom um, that best suits your lifestyle. So I want to thank you all so much for your time today and talking with us, sharing the different um, perspectives and options that are available in so many different countries. It's really been a wonderful discussion. And as part of the WellSpec partnership with OSCA, uh, ISCOS, we have a number of podcasts and webinars that are already published that you can listen to and view. So please do remember to subscribe to the ISCOS YouTube channel for alerts of new content going live. And thank you so much for watching, and we hope you found this webinar informative.